submission in opposition to the notices of motion before you, may I kindly request the court to ask that that light, which is a bit blinding, be either angled further up or turned off completely. The light has had. <laughs> I guess that makes it a smart light, madam. It can understand and react. Well, look, the applications before you for conservatory orders this evening are opposed. Um, for the record, I am Paul Nyamodi. I am on record with, together with my learned friend, Mr. Gumbo, for the second respondent. <coughs> and my Lord, I wish to commence my submission by saying that the task before you this evening is a rather simple task. Uh, listening to my colleagues making their submissions, um, one would be uh, forgiven if they formed the impression that what was for hearing before you was the petition proper. It is not. What is before you for hearing are two applications for conservatory orders. And my lords, it is my submission that the criteria, which you will no doubt consider when you retire to consider your decision in this matter, is straightforward. Is there, do the petitions before you disclose inherent merit? Would those petitions be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders that are sought are not granted? And lastly and most importantly, is it in the public interest to grant the conservatory orders that are sought? I wish to state that the purpose of a conservatory order or the ultimate beneficiary of a conservatory order is the court and not the party that seeks the conservatory order. I say so because the purpose of a conservatory order, my lords, is to preserve a situation so that the orders of the court upon conclusion of the hearing of the petition are efficacious. <coughs> that is not achieved by returning anybody to office. That is merely achieved by maintaining a status quo for the benefit of the court. So anybody who seeks to persuade you that they, are, they can be returned to office by a conservatory order, then perhaps has misunderstood what indeed a conservatory order is. My Lord, just to pull the strands together from the submissions that have been made by my learned colleagues for the respondent, and the context in which I urge my Lord, my Lady, to view those submissions, is that they have spoken to the first ground. They have spoken to the first ground in Peter Munya. They have spoken, or they are responding to the question, is there inherent merit in the petitions that are before you? All the submissions about public participation, all the submissions about the uh, Article 50 rights are all in an attempt to persuade you that there is no inherent merit in those petitions. And I don't wish to go back on those, but I wish to just put two issues before you in respect of the question of inherent merit. My lords, my lady, when you retire to consider your decision in this matter, I'm sure you will need no reminding that the issue of or a merit review of the impeachment process is beyond the ability of this court. So reject any requests from the petitioners to conduct a merit review of the impeachment. What this court is able to do, and I believe that is uh, the, the, the decision of the Supreme Court in Sonko, is to carry out a process review. And so that you are, so I, I then submit that in determining whether there is inherent merit, this court must then constrain itself to carrying out a process review. My lord, my lady, the second point I wish to make in respect of inherent merit is this. This is, or these petitions arise from a concluded <coughs> impeachment process. In that impeachment process, as you have heard, there were 11 grounds for impeachment. 
From those 11 grounds, the Senate rejected six and confirmed five. Out of those five, three grounds, and those are grounds one, ground five, and ground six, turned on the conversation or the issue that has come to be known as the shareholder narrative. <coughs> now, the first petitioner does not deny that he said those things that he is alleged to have said. It is my submission that there being no denial as to those utterances from the first petitioner, he acknowledges that he said them. There is an admission from the petitioner that he said those things that he said. Now, those three grounds of impeachment flowing from facts that the petitioner has admitted, can there be any inherent merit in a petition that seeks to challenge grounds that he has admitted? Ground one, ground five, and ground six all flow from the shareholder narrative. It is my submission that there can be no inherent merit in those petitions. The finding by the Senate flows from an admission, and that then takes away the ability of the first petitioner to challenge the Senate's finding. My lords, my lady, I wish to move on to the second ground, or the second issue that you are you you would need to consider when you retire to consider your decision on this matter and that is the issue of whether the petitions would be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders that are sought are not granted and i wish to submit on it with the conjoined issue of what is the appropriate remedy in the circumstances of these petitions My lords, my ladies, in my preparation for my submissions before you this evening, I came across uh, a pitch of a decision. And I wish to persuade you that the applications before you are for dismissal. And I wish to persuade you by reference to the notices of motion that are before you and to decisions of this court that have been rendered in respect of similar <coughs> matters. My Lord, there is a decision that is in pari materia with this one completely, and I say so for these reasons. The decision, and we have filed it as our, in a supplementary list of authority, is the decision of the High Court of Kenya in Constitutional Petition Number 4 of 2024, Purity Mora Kerira versus the Senate and eight others. It is a decision of the High Court of Kenya in Nyamira. And it is a decision of your sister, Justice Wilfrida Okoin. We have filed it as, as a supplementary uh, authority, but I have taken the liberty, because it is important to our submission, to make copies available to the bench, which I wish to uh, just walk you through quickly uh, during my submission. My lords, I submit that that decision is in pari materia with this one for the following reasons. It arises from a impeachment process of the Deputy Governor of Kisi County. <coughs> As I will demonstrate in a moment, the impeachment was preceded by litigation. The impeachment of the first petitioner in this matter was preceded by no less than 29 petitions. My lords, in that matter, a conservatory order was issued in a petition brought by a surrogate litigant. And perhaps I might want to explain what I mean by a surrogate litigant. Our constitution enables constitutional litigation by a person other than the direct beneficiary of the order sought. And for the purposes of my submission, 
I seek your Lordship's permission to refer to that sort of litigation as surrogate litigation. In this matter, a conservatory order is issued in a petition filed by a surrogate litigant. Subsequent to the to the to the to the to the impeachment of the deputy governor of Kisi by the county assembly of Kisi, the matters are then, or the various matters are then directed through the office of the principal judge to Lady Justice Wilfrida Okwine sitting in Nyamira. And Lady Justice Okwine is then faced with an application such as the one before this court this evening, where a party who has obtained ex parte conservatory orders wishes to persuade the court to confirm those orders. My Lord, I wish to start my reference to this decision in paragraph 63 of that decision. <coughs> paragraph 63 is to be found on page 17, and in her usual succinct style, Lady Justice Okwany holds <coughs> as follows. My attention is drawn to the use of the term and in the above cited decision, which connotes that the parameters set for the granting of conservatory orders are to, be, are to be considered conjunctively and not disjunctively. The decision she's referring to is the decision of Wilson Kibera versus the Judges and Magistrates Vetting Board. It is in paragraph 62, and it sets out the criteria for the grant of a conservatory order. She goes on to conclude in paragraph 63. This means that the failure to satisfy one parameter leads to the collapse of the entire application for the failure to meet the threshold set for granting of conservatory orders. And is used between the threshold issue, between the issue of inherent merit and nugatory. We have submitted sufficiently on the issue of inherent merit. I will not add to it. I will leave it to your lordships and your ladyship to decide. But I wish to state that in the petition before you, the petition would not be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders sought were not granted. And I wish to commence that submission by reference to the notices of motion themselves. The first notice of motion I wish to refer the members of the court to is the notice of motion in petition 565 of 2024 where the first petitioner, the uh, deputy or the former deputy president of the Republic of Kenya, is the petitioner. My learned colleague, Mr. Gumbo, has gone through the, 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 the prayers that are spent and those that are live. But I want to focus on prayer 6 and prayer 7. Prayer 6 and prayer 7 of the notice of motion. Prayer 6 reads, pending the hearing and determination of the petition, a, a conservatory order be issued staying the effect implementation in any way, including by gazettement and by any person of the vote resolution made by the Senate of Kenya on the 17th of October 2024, upholding the impeachment charges against the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagos. Prayer 7 says, pending the hearing and determination of the petition, a conservatory order be issued staying the implementation in any way, including by way of transmission to the National Assembly or the President of the, uh, sorry, or to the President of the Republic of Kenya, the vote slash resolution passed by the Senate of Kenya on the 17th of October 2024, upholding the impeachment charges against Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency, Rigada Igeshago. My lords, my ladies, I wish to refer you now to the other notice of motion before you, that is the notice of motion in petition number 15 from Kelgoya, and I wish to refer you to prayer D in that notice of motion. Prayer D in that notice of motion reads as follows. Pending the hearing and determination of this petition, this honorable court be pleased to issue a conservatory order staying the implementation of the resolution passed by the Senate and published by Gazette Notice number 13,400 on the 17th of October 2024, removing the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, from office by way of impeachment. Those three prayers seek to stay the impeachment. Mr. Gumbo has submitted about the effect of the impeachment. I wish to refer you now to the finding of your sister, Lady Justice Wilfrida Okwine, in respect to those sort of prayers. My Lord, paragraph 71 of Justice Okwine's decision. 
reads as follows. In the instant case, I note that the impugned impeachment process has, has already gone full circle, uh, has been concluded, and a final resolution made by the Senate to impeach the ninth respondent. And again, here the deputy governor was the ninth respondent, uh, and the petitioner was the surrogate respondent. Uh, respondent. Uh, uh, ninth respondent, as at the time the instant petition was filed. It is instructive to note that the impeachment proceeded despite spirited attempts by the ninth respondent to stop the process through applications made in, in, uh, in, in similar petitions that are still pending before various courts. That is not too dissimilar to this, and those are the petitions that are before you under the first cohort, petition 522. Paragraph 72, the question which arises uh, is if this court can issue orders whose effect will be to stay the decision by the Senate to impeach the ninth respondent pending the hearing and determination of the petition. My finding is that since the Senate has already made a resolution, the court must exercise restraint and limit its, 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 its intervention in the impeachment to hearing the merits of the petition. I further find that issuing conservatory orders to stay the Senate's decision will be akin to directing or interfering with other organs slash arm of government in exercise of its mandate. My lords, my ladies, in respect of the two prayers or the three prayers that I have <coughs> highlighted, I urge you strongly to adopt the same finding as Lady Justice Okwan in paragraph 71 and 72. My lords, my ladies, Lady Justice Okwan then goes on substantively to deal with the consideration on the second ground of Nugatov. In paragraph 73, she, she states, the other pertinent question is whether the instant petition will be rendered obligatory or worthless if the orders sought in the first application are not granted. Now, she then begins to reflect on the obligatory consideration. My Lord, in paragraph 74, she states, the answer to the above question is to the negative. And she starts straight from the beginning by saying no. I find that the applicants claim that the petition will be rendered nugatory to be misconceived and unfounded. My finding is informed by three main issues. And she goes on. Firstly, the applicant's petition is still pending for hearing and is therefore possible, and, and, and is therefore possible that the court may, after hearing the petition, arrive at a finding that the impeachment process was flawed. Very much like in this matter. She goes on. In, 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 such, in, in such any eventuality, the court may grant the petitioner and indeed the ninth respondent various remedies including, and this is important, compensation for wrongful removal or instatement. Compensation for wrongful removal. One of my learned colleagues suggested that compensation or one month's salary is a remedy. That is a remedy as confirmed by your sister Lady Justice Kwan. And she also states that reinstatement is possible. She goes on, I find guidance in the decision in Muhammad and six others versus the County Assembly of Wajia. This is the decision called the Wajia decision, where the court ordered for the reinstatement of the governor who had gone through the entire impeachment process up to the Senate. The court rendered itself thus, and this finding is important. And I submit that when you retire to consider your decision in this matter, go through the Wajia decision and see the entire raft of relief that that three-judge bench sitting in Meru did. And the relief was as follows. Uh, as appropriate consequential relief, an order of mandatory injunction is granted against the eighth respondent, Ahmed Ali Mukhtar. This was the deputy governor who had been sworn in as governor after the impeachment of the governor, compelling him to hand over and restore the office of governor of the county of Wajia to the seventh petitioner, Ambassador Mohammed Abdi Mahmoud. That is the appropriate remedy. And I had stated at the beginning that a conservatory order is given for the benefit of the court, not for any party. And if the court then has that ability, then there is no need, I submit, to then issue a conservatory order. But not to explain herself further, I refer you to paragraph 77 of that decision. Lady Justice Okwan states as follows. She states that this court takes the view that an impeachment process
can be likened to an election process where, for example, a governor and his deputy are elected by majority votes. Following such an election, the will of the majority voters prevails and is acted upon within the timelines set under law. This is done through the gazettement and swearing in of the deputy governor, of the governor and his deputy, I'm sorry, within the set timelines, irrespective of the existence of a petition challenging. In other words, the outcome of an election cannot be stayed through a conservatory order. Suffice it to say that if at the conclusion of the election, petition challenging such an election, the election court finds that the election process was marred with irregularities, then the election will be nullified and the aggrieved party granted suitable reliefs. Importantly, in paragraph 78, overly, in similar fashion, and as I have already stated in this ruling, if upon hearing the merits of the instant petition, this court finds in favor of the petitioner, then the ninth, ninth respondent will get appropriate remedies, which may include reinstatement to his position of deputy governor, as was held in the Wajia case. And I urge you to substitute deputy governor with deputy president. There is no difference in the position. He is a deputy to an executive office created under the Constitution. She concludes, I am therefore not persuaded that the instant petition will be rendered nugatory unless the conservatory orders granted, uh, sought are granted to the first applicant. My Lord, this is the same as in this matter. <coughs> there, there are effective remedies. There is reinstatement. There is damages. My Lord, reflecting further on the issue, in paragraph 79, the last sentence, or the second last sentence beginning on the third line from the bottom, Lady Justice Okwan says the following. I, find, I further find that since the office of deputy governor is a public office, it does not belong to a specific individual. It follows that once the office holder is impeached, he has to give room to the next office holder, unless and until such impeachment is overturned or nullified by an order of the court. There is no difference in this matter. The office of deputy president is an office in the public service. It has been submitted that it is a trust. It does not belong to, there is no right post impeachment that the first petitioner can claim to that office. But profoundly, in paragraph 80, she concludes as follows. I find that in the circumstances of this case, the rights stroke interest of the people of Kisi, I urge the court to read the people of Kenya, to be represented and served by a duly appointed deputy president. Read deputy governor, read deputy president, following the ninth respondent's impeachment, far outweighs the prejudice, if any, that the applicant herein will suffer if the orders sought in her application are not granted. My lords, my ladies, at this juncture, I wish to refer you to prayers 8 and 9 in the notice of motion in petition E565 and prayer E in the notice of motion in E in petition E015. Prayer 9 says, pending the hearing and determination of the petition, a conservatory order staying uh, the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency William F. Ruto, from, nom from nomination of a person to fill the vacancy in the office of Deputy President, and 8, pending the hearing and determination of the petition, a conservatory order restraining the National Assembly of Kenya from discussing, vetting, voting, and or approving the nomination of the person submitted to the National Assembly made on the 18th of October 2024 by the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency William S. Ruto, to fill the vacancy in the office of Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Prayer E in the Notice of Motion from Kerugoya is the same. In light of the findings of your sister, <coughs> Lady Justice Okwan, in paragraph 79 and 80 of her decision, I submit that those prayers are untenable. To express myself slightly differently from Lady Justice Okwan, <coughs> what she acknowledges in paragraph 78 and 79 of that decision is the public interest. 
the third limb of the considerations that you would need to consider when you, re you, re you retire to consider this de decision. It is not in the public interest for somebody who has been impeached to come to court for the court to maintain a vacancy in that public office pending the hearing and determination of a petition on challenging their impeachment. That is quite apart, my lords, my ladies, from the fact that this court can fashion appropriate remedies. It is not in the public interest. As recognized by your sister, Lady Justice Okwan, the people of Kenya have an overwhelming right to have that office of deputy president occupied during the pendency of the first petitioner's challenge of his impeachment before you. And that right is acknowledged as being infinitely larger than any prejudice that may be occasioned to the first petitioner if that office is filled. My lords, my ladies, there was a submission that it would be impossible to remove a deputy president uh, if he is sworn in because of an immunity that is enjoyed under the Constitution. I believe that the immunity, and I believe it is Article 143 of the Constitution, is to the President only. And I submit, my lords, my ladies, that it is possible for the orders of this court to be efficacious without reference to the President. Mr. Mudomi's client is and remains amenable to the orders of this court. And that remains so even if he ascends to the high office of Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. My lords, my ladies, the conclusion of your sister, Lady Justice Okwan, and I wish to conclude just by referring you to paragraph 82 of her decision, where she says, Flowing from the above advisory opinion, and she is quoting the advisory opinion of the Supreme Court in re, the Speaker of the County Assembly of Embo. And uh, because we are acknowledging matters that we argued, I must acknowledge that I did argue that matter. Uh, quoting that advisory opinion, she says, I find that the moment the Senate made the resolution to impeach the ninth respondent, the office of deputy governor immediately became vacant, that set setting the stage for the filling of the vacancy within the stipulated timelines. My finding is that the public interest in this case supports compliance with the constitutional and statutory timelines set for the filling of the vacancy in the office of deputy president, deputy governor of Kisi County. There is an argument that has been made by the petitioners that the constitution creates a timeline of 74 days for concluding the process. The, con <coughs> the, the Constitution, yes, does provide 74 days. But there is nothing wrong with concluding the process in a faster time frame than 74 days. Nobody has suggested that that is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Nobody has, other than expressing you know, surprise as to the speed at which it happened, nobody has said what's wrong with it. Going by the finding of Lady Justice Okwan, I trust that I have submitted, I have persuaded you that the two notices of motion before you this evening are for dismissal. They should be dismissed, and you should then enable the public interest <coughs> and the people of Kenya to then have a deputy president as entitled by their constitution. I am most obliged. I will take my seat unless uh, my lords, my ladies have anything you wish me to carry. Thank you. How many people do you have? Yes, who are here to submit. You, my Lord, I am taking uh, the least minimum the time. I believe there are two more.